We tried to provide in the report an overview of the type of climate decisions that people are making and the information that they might be looking for. So for example, uh, people managing fire in the West, uh, people managing water resources are of course concerned about how climate may be changing and will change in the future and how that might affect the risk of fire or the risk of drought um, and how they might bring that into their planning. Corporate uh, risk disclosure is now moving to the point where shareholders are asking companies what their exposure might be to climate risks. And this is both the risks of how climate change might affect a company's operation, but also the risks that climate policy might affect a company's bottom line. And recently, the Securities and Exchange Commission has given guidance on climate risk disclosure. And this is generating a whole new set of demands for climate information, both about climate impacts and about um, greenhouse gas emissions. Overall, the America's Climate Choices Study and the scientific literature at large have led to a clear consensus among scientists that climate change is occurring and that the major factor in producing that climate change are greenhouse gases which are caused by human activities. Given that, it's very important to think about how we make the information about climate change available to individuals and organizations at all levels, how we standardize it, how we talk about it, and how we put it in a form upon which they can base sensible decisions whether it's New York City or Chicago that are developing adaptation plans, in order to have a good adaptation plan, you really need a good set of information, both about your present climate, how sea level might rise, what sorts of climate change scenarios are possible for your region, but also about where you're vulnerable. In the United States, there are many efforts to reduce emissions and to think about adaption to climate change, and in some cases, to take actual steps to do it. The information on which all of those activities are based tends, however, to be a little bit helter-skelter. There are several important gaps that we identified in terms of the information that's being provided to people. One would be that a lot of information is not provided at the more local scale that people need for decision-making in America, um, at the city level, at the firm level. A second thing is that um, there's quite a lot of confusion about where to get information from and um, there's no single sort of go-to place like a web portal where you can go and find out what sort of information is available at the federal government. The third area where you could center there's a gap is that um, in some cases there's competing information that's confusing citizens and decision makers which carbon calculator is the best one to use, for example, or where do I find out uh, how to adapt to climate change? People are beginning to provide climate services, and NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, has announced its uh, determination to provide a kind of a coordinated effort in that area. But climate services, that is information about climate change and its probable consequences across the board, can really be done adequately only by the coordination of many agencies with the leadership of some. They need to coordinate and then coordination needs to come between them and all of the private and non-federal actors. A national response means more than a federal response. It means that the response to climate change in America needs to take into account the full range of actors, states, cities, counties, private companies, large and small, individual citizens, and non-governmental organizations. And one of the reasons we call for a national response is if you look at how many decisions and responses are being made outside the federal government, you could consider that if you aggregated all of those decisions and actions and knew that they were effective, that that would actually sort of reduce the burden on the federal government and perhaps the re reduce the costs in terms of the federal government's response to climate change. One of the things that our report suggests is that it's important not to sort of unnecessarily damage what might be going on at the state and local level and to enhance it instead. One area, for example, would be in the development of cap and trade systems because we already have state level and um, regional level cap and trade systems. 
and those have certain requirements for the sort of reporting of greenhouse gas information. And you could see a situation where if the federal government chose to develop a cap and trade system, that it might undermine what's going on out there. It might have different standards for information provision um, or, you know, it, it could sort of not give people credit for action they've already taken. We recommend um, that the federal government support and coordinate a greenhouse gas accounting system um, because of the importance of the monitoring, reporting and verification of greenhouse gases as we try to limit the magnitude of climate change. A major company that's trying to be a leader in reducing their emissions wants to ensure that what they report is seen as credible and that there are not a lot of other people out there who are claiming emission reductions that they're not actually making. I mean, it, it's really creating a better landscape for business. People need to be informed about the environment generally and also about climate change and they are not uh, well informed at the present because in primary school, in secondary school, in universities, we don't always get a good background in the environment. When we come to an issue like climate change, we have the interaction of many fields, geology, biology, the atmosphere, the water cycle, and to understand all of that and to be able to therefore participate intelligently in the arguments is going to require an effort to build up the level and amount of education about climate change and other environmental areas. Climate communication is important because primarily of the potential for miscommunication. So in the report we review um, some of the studies that have been done on how to communicate climate change effectively and we actually provide a, a sort of table of tips on uh, some of the ways to um, communicate climate change more effectively. One of the examples that we use is that many scientists, when they're talking about climate change, talk in degrees centigrade because that's the sort of scientific tradition. Whereas, of course, the American public is thinking in degrees Fahrenheit. Another example is we talk about the problem of the use of the term uncertainty. Sometimes when the public hears the word uncertainty, they think we're saying we don't know what's going on. So we suggest we might think of other ways to communicate that particular idea. In order to make the most informed response in an area that will cost everyone a lot of money and a lot of effort for decades and possibly centuries to come, we really have to depend on people hearing, getting, trusting and understanding the best information possible.